Well, welcome everybody to this seminar, our third in our series on carbon neutral agriculture. And I'm looking forward to the final in the series today with our two speakers. But first let's acknowledge country. And as we gather to go to the meeting from different places around Australia, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet. And I'm meeting here on the, the lands of the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've joined us online today. As we share and discuss our knowledge and practices, we acknowledge their deep knowledge forever embedded in the custodianship of country. And thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to, uh, just a couple of housekeeping matters before we get going, as you realise as you came into the webinar, it is being recorded. Um, you're very welcome to ask questions throughout the, the talk, but we probably won't answer them till, till the uh, both speakers have spoken. When you put up your questions in the questions and answers session, they will be seen by other people, so that's good. And similarly, you can also put things in the chat function. But I would encourage you to ask your questions in the questions and answers section. It's easier for us to keep an eye on those to make sure we can attend to them later on in the meeting. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Snow Barlow to introduce the speakers. Thanks, Snow. Welcome uh, to uh, uh, this uh, third of the uh, uh, Carbon Neutral Food Series uh, from the Academy. Um, the previous two of these uh, uh, webinars have uh, are available on the Academy's website. If so if you are interested in those, please go to them. Um, Last week, uh, we were finally aligned in, in Australia policy-wise with now that all governments and territories have uh, undertaken a net carbon zero or net zero emissions policy by 2050, uh, although they vary widely uh, in their plans and strategies to, to achieve that. Today, we're concentrating on the agricultural and food sector. What we want to do today is I've, we have two very eminent and uh, knowledgeable speakers. Uh, I've given uh, Dr. Beverly Henry a, uh, the very daunting task of uh, trying to summarize uh, how we have arrived uh, at COP26 in Glasgow. <coughs> why are we are doing this uh, and why is agriculture involved? Uh, then drilling down to uh, what is agriculture in Australia's relative emissions contributions and what rel relative the industries within that are. Uh, further, uh, then Bev will, who has extensive experience in the Emissions Reduction Fund, now the Climate Solutions Fund, uh, of the methodologies and requirements of that fund. Bev uh, has enormous experience uh, in this field, uh, having really joined it in the mid 90s, uh, and uh, being part, uh, ironically, with Richard uh, of uh, the sort of groundbreaking CRC for carbon accounting that we put together immediately post Kyoto. Um, Bev uh, has many national and international roles at present, but perhaps the most significant uh, for this seminar is uh, until quite recently, Bev was a member of the Emissions Reduction Assurance Committee of the Emission Reductions Fund. Uh, so we look forward to hearing Bev in a moment. To introduce Richard, uh, I, Dr. Richard Eck, uh, Professor Richard Eck uh, is the uh, Director of the Melbourne University uh, Climate Challenges, uh, Primary Industries Climate Challenges Centre. He was recently named uh, by Reuters as one of the most influential, 1,000 influential uh, climate scientists in the world. 
I've asked Richard to briefly review the science and the uh, potential technologies available for agriculture to tackle our two most uh, you know, largest emissions, you know, basically ruminant methane and soil nitrous oxide emissions. So let's begin. And uh, I would ask Beverly Henry to begin uh, by talking as we described. Thank you, Bev. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this webinar. I'm joining you um, today from the uh, from Bundjalung country. And um, it really is a pleasure to discuss this uh, rather complex but um, timely topic. Just to give a, a brief outline, um, what I'm going to do today, as Snow said, is just give um, some context setting for today's discussion. Um, many of you will have a deep knowledge of the background for um, carbon accounting and for um, the greenhouse issues that we're going to be discussing. But I think because it's such a fast moving topic and there's so much happening, we will, uh, I'll give a quick overview and um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, after that, I'll, I will focus on um, the opportunities and the pathways that are available, looking particularly at um, offsets and sequestration and their contribution to net zero and carbon neutral goals before handing over to Richard to discuss um, in detail some of the, the um, sources. Next slide, thanks. So the summit that's happening now in Glasgow is receiving a lot of attention, perhaps drawing more attention to climate change than at any time since um, 2015, when COP21 um, set in motion the Paris Agreement and some of these um, issues that, that are now hitting the headlines. COP26, the 26th Conference of Parties, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, had as its overall uh, goal to further the Paris Agreement actions that are aimed at limiting global warming to no more than two degrees centigrade and preferably um, less than 1.5 degrees. And this is to be achieved through efforts of all countries, developed and developing countries as set out in nationally determined contributions. That is the pledges to take action. Um, those pledges are to be reviewed every five years. And um, so COP26 is the opportunity for countries to look at those um, promises again and to strengthen them as is the intent sent out, set out in the Paris Agreement. And also to say how they will contribute to a global goal of reaching net zero by the middle of the century. Um, so within those discussions, um, we need to bear in mind that each country looks at its own circumstances and what can be achieved. Next slide, thanks. An important issue is um, how the, um, the objectives of the Paris Agreement are to be quantified, how they're to be tracked. And it's worth noting there that the, the rules and the um, reporting against climate change commitments are actually built on about 30 years of um, global action to address climate change, starting um, in 1992 with the formation of the United Nations Framework Convention, um, underpinned by science, but also recognizing that it was almost a century before that, that the greenhouse effect was first noted. So these counting rules are, are intended to um, demonstrate what's been happening, uh, but also to quantify not only the emissions and the contribution to climate change, but the mitigation efforts that can be undertaken. Next slide, thanks. The main driver for um, action 
at the moment is um, a realisation that climate change is, is real, I guess. And while it's a, a gross oversimplification, there are two major drivers within, within that um, action oriented uh, approach. The first is the growing evidence of increasing economic losses due to weather related events and the attribution of those changes to anthropogenic climate change. So the graph on the left shows um, the two decades of this century and the increasing economic implications of, of those weather related events. And it's um, to some extent, the financial sector and the insurance industry that's driving um, actions by not only governments, but also by private in the private sector. The other illustration on this slide um, that is a driver for action is that related to intergenerational justice. That if we, if we look at what's happening now and a person of my generation, and you look to the future of a person born in the current um, decade, they will suffer about three times as many climate disasters as what I have in my lifetime. And that um, puts a responsibility with, on this generation, on, this, um, on these, today's um, world leaders to actually act. And that responsibility is uh, reminded, we're reminded that responsibility very often by um, young people um, protesting against the lack of progress, I guess, on climate um, action. Next slide, thanks. The Paris Agreement set out commitments to achieve that action. But when we look at um, what has been happening and what progress is being made, um, it becomes rather clear that uh, what's, what has been achieved, even the pledges that have been promised and the optimistic view of what might be achieved by mid-century is not going to bring us to the point where we can um, feel confident that global temperature rise will be limited to two degrees centigrade or, or preferably to 1.5. The orange line in the middle of this graph um, is the optimistic outcome of net zero targets. And um, you can see that what's needed to get to two degrees or 1.5 degrees is the strengthening the actions to be taken. And so even though 195 or it might be 196 now countries have submitted pledges for 2030 and um, over 140 have made commitments to mid-century um, net zero, um, we don't really have actions, uh, have, um, actions and plans that are going to deliver the um, management of, of the risk of climate change yet. So that's why we need to look at these issues more carefully, look at what net zero means, look at uh, what um, carbon neutrality means and the opportunities that they are, the pathways that are available as, to us to meet those goals. Next slide. So we turn now to, um, to what's happening in Australia and Australia's targets. Um, and um, this slide sets out, firstly, um, the, the national um, targets, the, the state and territory targets, and the private sector targets that are currently in force in Australia. The national targets um, have been discussed a lot in the media recently, the 26 to 28% below 2005 by 2030, and the net zero by 2050 target that was agreed um, just a week ago. All state and territories in Australia have set net zero commitments of some, to some extent by um, dates from 2030 to 2050. 
I'd like to just um, note though that the industry, the industry, the private sector panel that I've got there is one of the more interesting and, and these are just examples um, that, um, of, of exa the examples of actions being taken, but there are many more, you know, daily there seem to be new commitments to, um, to, what's, uh, to taking action to address climate change. And one of the drivers for that is um, apart from apart from the wanting to meet these goals, is the risk that penalties will be imposed in terms of trade, in terms of um, uh, insurance to those bodies that aren't taking sufficient action. So the European Union is discussing a carbon border adjustment mechanism that would put uh, tariffs or um, uh, penalties on goods coming from countries or production systems that are not strong enough in their commitments to climate change. Next slide. So just um, sort of looking at, at Australia's net zero pledge, which is the strongest indication we have for long-term action at the moment. And while um, it's, there's no clarity yet on how, on the details, we know that the actions that are being taken on the state government level and on for private industries will commit to that. We just don't exactly um, have the details of how it's going to be achieved. Um, and the point that I'd like to raise here in discussing that is the, um, the fact that we have a number of terms that are being used, net zero, net zero carbon dioxide in some cases, carbon neutrality. And it's, um, it's important to note that these are being used somewhat differently. There's a degree of uncertainty about the interpretation of those terms. So while they were introduced under the Paris Agreement, it wasn't until the IPCC special report in 2018, three years later, that there was um, a global definition, I guess. But in the meantime, um, common usage had taken over so if we look at the definitions that the IPCC um, put forward, they say that um, net zero is more formally defined as being achieved when anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere are balanced by anthropogenic removals over a specified period. Net zero carbon or net zero carbon dioxide emissions is similar, but refers to the balance of carbon dioxide rather than all greenhouse gases. And according to the IPCC definition, net zero carbon dioxide is equivalent to carbon neutrality. However, carbon neutrality is more commonly used by um, organisations and by governments to encompass all greenhouse gases. So the Australian red meat industry, carbon neutral 2030 goal, looks at all, all gases. So what we can't solve that definitional problem now, but it's worth being um, aware that some countries' carbon, new, carbon zeros commitments are only looking at carbon dioxide and that uh, we need to, to understand, I guess, where Australia sits in that. And our, our goal does encompass all greenhouse gases from the plan that's been put forward. Um, and I'd like to note within that, that another important distinction that's made is that carbon net zero has an implicit um, understanding that emissions will firstly be reduced as far as possible and balanced by offsets only for the residuals that are left. Whereas carbon neutrality is used in some spheres as um, not having the same expectation for reduction in emissions, just that um, carbon neutrality will be achieved with offsets. So um, I guess the bottom line is that both offsets and emissions um, will be needed and the Australian 
net zero diagram there clearly notes that offsets will have up to 20%, will balance up to 20% of our emissions under what they see being achieved for that pledge. Next slide, thanks. So where are we at now? If we look at our national uh, inventory reported trends um, and focusing on the blue line firstly, um, and the 20, 2005 uh, Paris baseline, we're now about 20% below that level and um, look set to reach the 26 to 28% um, by 2030. Um, and modelling indicates with other actions that are being taken, um, 20, 30 to 38% could be achieved by 2030. It's also important to note here though, that we will achieve that goal because of reductions in the land use change and forestry sector. So reductions in emissions from land clearing is absolutely critical to our having been able to reach that goal. And if you look at the graph on the right, and this is just for the 2020 inventory, you can see the sectors of interest to us today, agriculture um, is about 15% of total emissions and land use, land use change and forestry, the, land, the forestry, forest sector is a sink, a net sink of about 5%. Next slide. So towards car, the pathway towards carbon neutral food. Um, land sector we, is important. Um, land clearing in 2020 was about 44 megatons, um, forest, regrowth and vegetation thickening contributed about 71 um, megatons of sink, so a net of about 26 megatons. And looking at agriculture sector, um, the biggest emission is from grazed, grazed beef cattle and um, the animal emissions overall represent something like 70% um, or 8% of, of total emission. Uh, of total agricultural emissions. Um, so this is, this is where the sectors of interest for food sit at the moment. And the clear point there is that achieving carbon neutral food will need both emissions reduction and offsets. And those offsets are most likely to come from vegetation and soils. Next slide. So um, what have we got to achieve those reductions in emissions and that increase in, in sequestration? The main policy instrument in Australia is the Emissions Reduction Fund. So the Emissions Reduction Fund uh, was in force from 2015 to about 2020. Um, the Climate Solutions Fund sits under the Emissions Reduction Fund to continue that $2.55 billion of funding with an additional $2 billion. Um, and that, that funding is deliver, has the function of delivering crediting, purchasing and compliance roles under the Carbon Farming Initiative, which was first set in place in 2011. And through those functions, it delivers carbon credit units. Each carbon credit um, is equivalent to one tonne of, one megaton of, sorry, one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent um, emissions reduction or um, sequestration. And um, it is called an Australian Carbon Credit Unit or an ACU. And those credits can be used to offset emissions in other sectors or within the agriculture sector. Um, the Emissions Reduction Fund covers all sectors, but they will only have value as offsets if each of those units has an equivalence with the emissions that are being caused. So if burning coal releases one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, the offset has to be, um, a, has to be equivalent to that emission to offset it. To 
ensure that the credits issued under the Emissions Reduction Fund have credibility and it can actually be used as offsets. There's a set of offsets integrity standards to, um, that are, if implemented correctly, make sure that each, each uh, unit is real. It represents abatement that is real, eligible to be counted in our um, inventory. It's measurable, it's conservative. And only when that's done can an ACU have integrity. And um, that's one of the most critical points because there have been offsets generated internationally um, that have no, in, that, that, that don't have credibility. Um, you know, the, the hot air that has been talked about quite a bit. And it's, um, it's important that within our legislation, that integrity is protected, um, even as efforts are ramped up to increase emissions. Participation in the Emissions Reduction Fund um, by individuals or organisations is voluntary. Um, so, but, so what has been achieved under that, under that legislation to date? So it's about a thousand projects registered under the Emissions Reduction Fund. Um, and of those projects, over 500, about half have been um, issued with contracts by the Clean Energy Regulator, which, which um, means that they've con been contracted to deliver abatement to the government. And that's counted towards our meeting net zero or um, emissions limitations. Um, under our, our international commitments. Um, of the, uh, within those 500 or so projects, there's about 209 megatons of carbon dioxide that have been contracted to be delivered, but only 73 megatons have been delivered so far because the, um, the contract period is, um, seven years 20 to 25 years, depending on the type of project. The most popular projects or the, the most um, supported pro methods under the Emissions Reduction Fund are vegetation projects. So these are projects that um, preserve vegetation, so avoid clearing of trees or that regenerate forests. So allow natural regrowth to occur or um, have plantings, environmental plantings or commercial plantations. Um, within the agriculture sector, there is about 15 megatons um, that is being contracted and there's about 14 megatons under savanna burning that are sp specific to um, Northern Australia and um, the circumstances there by managing um, how much how savanna burning is done to, um, to reduce the emissions, mainly, particularly by having cool, cooler early season burning. Next slide. And then just to, just to reiterate what these, where these projects come from, this is a slightly um, earlier um, set of numbers um, and what's been delivered there. So I'm going to um, look in the next couple of slides at the sequestration that's occurring that is contracted to occur and has been has projects registered to deliver sequestration either in woody vegetation or in um, increasing soil carbon sequestration, which is one of the methods under the agriculture um, group of projects. And um, Richard will um, later look in some detail at um, uh, enteric methane and nitrous oxide emissions, um, including under these methods. Next slide, thanks. So the ERF vegetation projects, where are we up to? Um, so just going through um, the the ERF status on those at the moment and what the outlook is. There's 545 registered projects. This is in October. Um, uh, and they have 50, 56 million ACUs 
have been issued to date against vegetation projects. So vegetation projects you know, in forestry generation and in avoiding clearing of existing forests. But it also includes 32 plantation forestry projects. They've been issued with 52,000 um, ACUs. Uh, plantation in this case includes farm forestry. The methods with most projects are in shorthand, human-induced regeneration. So that, that means ta uh, taking away suppressors that have stopped natural uh, forestry generation. Um, you know, suppressors may be uh, weeds, grazing management, uh, use of fire, for instance. Um, avoided deforestation and native forest from managed regrowth. So letting um, regrowth come back, which would normally have undergone cyclical re-clearing, particularly for grazing management. There are um, additional methods being planned and have that have priority over the next 12 months or so. Um, and these are intended to extend the number of activities that can be used to generate um, ACUs credits and um, to make it easier and less administratively burdensome um, and costly to participate. And so you know, there are prospects for further um, actions being taken under the ERF for vegetation sinks. But how does that relate to what uh, assumptions are included in Australia's net zero plan? Well, firstly, I suppose that it's, there's, it's too early to say. There is um, insufficient detail in the plan at the moment to know how the modelling um, has been done to support um, what's assumed. But if you look at the assumption that's written into that plan, and that, that is that 63 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalents of accredited carbon offsets could be produced each year by 2050, and that that would involve 1.5 million hectares of on-farm environmental plantings around 2% of total agricultural land. What that means if you work it out is that that's 42 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year in 2050. Now, without the, the detail, we can't say too much, but that number is um, probably about twice what, um, what some of the science and the experience is telling us could be expected from environmental plantings on agricultural land. And we have to, um, I suppose, wait until we get the detail. But the modelling that is done to support that should include um, consideration of some of the realities that can limit sequestration environmental plantings. And that is that droughts will occur and that um, projects uh, that um, projects using environmental plantings will asymptote towards a, um, a maximum biomass. So that, um, you know, that it may take 30 years, but um, the rate of sequestration, the rate of growth will slow as those uh, those plantings reach their maximum biomass. Um, so that and the, I suppose the other, the other consideration in modeling is that these plantings have to take into consideration the permanency requirement. That means that um, they have to be um, um, in place for 25 to 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, over that time, you know, climate change looks set to um, have impacts that could increase the harshness of the climate and the rate of growth that may be possible. So I'll leave that, but um, I think, you know, looking, looking towards net zero, there are some um, questions that still have to be answered for vegetation projects, but there is a potential for considerable sequestration. Uh, next slide. And for soil carbon projects, 
um, those same considerations become important as I'll note in a minute. There are two um, sequestration uh, methods for soil carbon. Um, the only one that has projects registered is the measurement method. And um, the rate of registration of projects is actually almost, it's gone almost exponentially over the last um, couple of years. So to date now, there are about 150 registered projects, but only one has reported um, in part because of um, delays in um, being able to report sequestration. It's, it's a, a relatively slow process. And um, that one project has received almost 2,000 ACUs. There is a new method to be released in 2021, which allows for greater flexibility with measurement or modeling options. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't been released yet, so um, there may be further growth in projects. What the net zero plan has, and, and there has been quite a lot of enthusiasm for how much sequestration is possible from soil carbon. Um, the net zero plan assumes um, voluntary carbon of up to 20% of required abatement could come from, from these projects. Um, and at least 17 megatons from of accredited offsets in 2050. For soil carbon in particular, um, it's very, the modeling becomes quite complex when we look at, at uh, the potential for sequestration. Um, could you click on the next? Thank you. Um, and an important part of this is understanding why, uh, how soil carbon is, um, is limited, what drives soil carbon. So it depends largely on the growth of plants um, that contribute organic matter to the soil. And then how much of that is turned over by the microbes in the soil and lost again. So a, a meta-analysis that was done across the three Eastern states of Australia showed clearly that the primary driver of soil carbon levels in soils across managed lands was aridity, so rainfall and temperatures. Um, and if you look at, at um, the, the categories on the right-hand side, past type residue land uses, they have a very small impact relative to natural factors. And in fact, more than 80% of the driver of, of soil carbon is natural factors. So that um, means um, that we have to uh, have to take that into consideration when we look at the potential. So next slide, thanks. So just finishing up, I wanted to say that um, uh, that the there is sequestration potential to reach net zero, but it depends a lot on uptake by farmers, and um, there are a lot of consideration that goes into deciding what. Um, a carbon sequestration project might mean for farm business and what would fit with the management priorities and the objectives of that activity. So um, the, there are a number of projects to be considered and um, how they fit in with the business is going to determine whether there's voluntary participation. Uh, could you click again? You might have to do it twice. The, um, and I've included this diagram that has been produced by the government, by the Clean Energy Regulator, as um, a decision tree for taking part in sequestration projects. And I just included to emphasise it's not a simple decision. It requires a big commitment and, um, and an understanding of how it fits with farm business, including for permanence obligations. Um, next slide, thanks. And at that point, I uh, will hand over to Richard to talk about um, the greenhouse gas side, of our sources and sinks side. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen with you. Um,
So what uh, what I was asked to do was was go into some of the sort of more advanced technologies of um, uh, pathways towards carbon neutral agriculture. And just sorry, uh, at the bottom, I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and pay my respects to them. Um, what I'll do is just home in on not all the technologies that are available, just some of the more promising emerging or higher end technologies. Now, what becomes obvious is when we're looking at the challenge of methane and nitrous oxide as the two big greenhouse gases from agriculture, we're dealing with microbial systems in both cases. And these are systems like, for example, the, the rumen, the four stomachs of a, a cow, sheep, goats, they evolved about 50 million years ago with a steady state microbial composition that suits a particular diet and system. We've come along in the last 20, 30 years and said, we're gonna change all of that. Um, and so adaptation of mitigation strategies, adaptation of animals and soils to interventions is a major challenge. It's not simple. And we've seen many cases where we've intervened with some <clears throat> mitigation strategy and then the rumen just adapts fairly quickly and is back to business as usual. Give you some idea of how many bugs are in the rumen. Um, you know, you get some idea of the number of microbes in the rumen. And if I showed you the soils, it looks very similar in terms of numbers. And so I, we, we are inherently slightly skeptical of people coming along saying, we've got this uh, new soil ameliorant that has certain bugs in it that we're gonna introduce into your soil and it'll solve the problem. Because you're competing with 50 million years of evolution and a very large population of microbes inherent and the small contribution you might make is, is pretty, pretty modest to, to, to think that that's gonna completely change the system. Um, there's very little evidence that that actually can be done. So I would say the soils in the room have a very similar challenge, large microbial populations of dominant microbes that have sorted their hierarchy out in history. And we've got to find ways of changing that system. Now, I said I wasn't going to deal with all the strategies. And here's just a flow diagram that shows you from left to right, we've got uh, on the left, some of the do now strategies, some of the things that we can go in and breed animals for higher residual feed intake, or we can uh, reduce the number of unproductive animals in our livestock systems, um, or look at alternative livestock systems. But those are the more modest options as well. They have about a 10%, 15% impact. Shifting to the middle, we can change the diet of animals. We can breed plants that have secondary compounds in them. We can add oils into the diet, for example. Those are the things that step us up to about a 20% a, a reduction in methane. Those are also things we can do now. A lot of those strategies, I'll deal with some of them. On the right-hand side is that challenge of beating 50 million years worth of evolution. Can we go into biological control? Can we vaccinate? Can we do something more ambitious in the rumen, and I'll deal with those as well. And then I'll come to nitrous oxide with a similar flow diagram and show you. Um, so we won't be dealing with the, the left-hand side because that's the more obvious. I'll go straight into some of the promising options um, that are emerging separate to feeding oils and supplements and that. And they would be around some of the legumes and novel forages. We need to rediscover our legume, legume heritage. Um, we have uh, tropical legumes like Lachina and Desmanthus in Northern Australia. And where I'm working in East Africa on Desmodium as a silver leaf Desmodium as an option. Historically, we've done a fair bit of work around some of the temperate legumes as well. And these are, are options that exist for more extensive grazing. Legumes have got secondary compounds in them, phenolic compounds, tannins, um, that reduce methane by somewhere between 50 and 25%. Um, so not only do they provide uh, more benign sources of nitrogen, um, less greenhouse gas emitting sources of nitrogen, but they can also reduce methane in more than one way. I'll give you an example of leukina itself. So on the left there, you've got some, some work on leukina versus just a traditional Rhodes grass. And so leukina straight away is allowing animals to grow faster because you've addressed a nutrient limitation in say a traditional roads grass pasture by having a higher quality legume. Then 
not only that, so the animals are actually growing faster, they actually finish faster. I'll show you some data on that soon. So that's one strategy that complies, say, with the beef herd methodology. Animals go to market, that's a month less methane they produce. Then there's a, the actual secondary compound in the, the, the leukina, the actual tannin that appears to reduce methane itself. And you can see Rhodes grass on the left at three different time periods, leukina on itself, 21% um, less methane in the diet. So there's another strategy there, separate to the faster growth rate. Then we worked on um, irrigated leukina as an example. Um, uh, this is actually a case study up in uh, um, uh, central Queensland on the coast, where we compared a Rhodes grass to an irrigated leukina. And for the irrigated leukina, we carved out about 400 hectares of the original Rhodes grass and put it down to irrigated leukina. And you can see from the number of steers, we've doubled the number of animals, but we've kept the total greenhouse gas emissions the same. So now suddenly you've doubled agricultural production for the same total methane overhead. And you look at what we did to emissions intensity. Most times when you look at a mitigation strategy, you either reduce absolute emissions or you improve emissions intensity, you seldom get both. And here's an example where we've got both, an absolute reduction in methane, but also we've improved the emissions per unit of product produced. So we've gone from 8.4 down to 3.9 uh, tons of emissions per kilogram or ton of live weight. We've reduced, and that's partly because the animals were finished within 18 months versus 36 months. But look what we did to the average daily gain, 0.36 up to one. So clearly there's a strategy here that can be deployed by some producers uh, to be far more greenhouse gas efficient. Now, here's the interesting part about legumes is in that particular Rhodes grass scenario, you've got a nitrogen deficient system. It doesn't get nitrogen fertilized. It doesn't have native legumes at any large proportion. And so what you end up with is putting in leukina and it's nitrogen fixation of atmospheric nitrogen, it started contributing to the nitrogen cycle. And you've got Rhodes grass growing alongside leukina that's now growing faster and getting a better root system as a result. And you can see at the bottom all the pools of carbon that we modeled using the full cam model. And those are the pools that are in the leukina. But the gray line below the top black line is actually the soil carbon. So you can see we dropped a little bit because we disturbed the soil to put the leukina in. And then the leukina started fixing nitrogen and addressing that nitrogen deficiency. And you had all the soil carbon building up over time, steadying at a new steady state. So there's, there's a great need to bring these components together into a more system-wide methodology. So you can see, you can't just have a component offset method. You need something to recognize the earlier finishing. You need something to recognize the methane, and you need something to recognize the soil carbon benefit in a package deal. Now, just when you think you've got all the strategies under control, um, we were musing about this idea probably 15 years ago already that, well, we've only dealt with what's inside the animal. Can we deal with the methane after it comes out and, and oxidize it after it comes out? And sure enough, a technology has come out called ZELP, Zero Emissions Livestock Production, offering about a 50% reduction in methane after the animal belches it out. It's capturing it and oxidizing it. Now, you know, I, I see this like wind turbines. They have this fairly ugly statement on a hill telling us we need something better long term. And the same as a four kilo device hanging around a cow's neck is a symbol saying to us, long term, we need a better solution, but this might get us out of trouble in the meantime. Then we step it up to what I think are the more advanced te technologies, really broken the barrier of that sort of 20% reduction in methane and stepped it up. Um, where we've got the red algae or the brown algae, uh, up to 80% reduction in methane. Um, there are some due diligence issues still required before this is fully market ready because it has got uh, ozone depleting chemicals in it that we need to get a full handle on. But it has sent a signal saying large reductions in methane are possible. Um, so watch that space for the new science. There is a market ready compound that's in the same category called 3NOP and has shown about a 70% reduction in methane. Um, and it is market ready. It has about 45 peer reviewed papers sitting behind it on all aspects of due diligence. And we will see this come onto the market soon. Now, 
obviously these two technologies are really more geared to the confinement industries where you can feed on a daily basis like dairy or feedlot industries. So we do need something around slow release technologies to take these out to the more extensive grazing industries. To finish the methane section, there is the vaccine, which has been in research for many years, and we think that holds promise for more extensive grazing systems. But where I wanted to finish was some research that we put forward as a group a long time ago that it was possible that you could program an animal to just be low methane because your and my gut microflora are a product of our upbringing. Same with the ruminant. There is the ability to adjust the microbial bias in the rumen based on its weaning experience. And that graph on the right, you can see that evidence there where for the gray section, they used one of these inhibitors. They used 3NOP on the cows and calves. And then when they stopped after three weeks, those animals remained about 20% less methane for the rest of the, of the uh, 40, 50 days. So this is something we could look at developing as repeatable, uh, inheritable, transferable technology. Just a few thoughts on nitrous oxide. Now there's lots of things we can do around nitrous oxide, whether it be animal interventions around breeding for more efficient animals, introducing tannins into their diet to improve the nitrogen cycle, um, balancing energy to protein ratios in animals. But at the same time, we've got the uh, management soils, uh, fertilizers, being more efficient with the rate source timing of, of, of fertilizers and things we can do about soil management. I'll leave those with you, but the bottom line with nitrous oxide is any form of nitrogen that comes into our agricultural systems, be it from fertilizer, dung, urine, or soil microbial turnover that releases ammonium into the soil. Once that starts being converted to nitrate, there's a very small amount of nitrous oxide that comes off under those more aerobic soils in a process of nitrification. But the main source of nitrous oxide is this right-hand side of the diagram, which is denitrification, which releases under wet anaerobic warm soils, you can get large amounts of nitrous oxide evolved. Now, as I mentioned, there are things we can do around being more judicious with the form of nitrogen we use, the rates, the source, the timing, the placement. And in italics there, I've got all the different national BMP programs that are addressing these. There's also the formulation of fertilizer, which is becoming more important. So can we have fertilizers that have inhibit inhibitors built into them? Or can we look at slower sources of nitrogen, like legumes, which introduce a more organic form of nitrogen that takes longer to break down? Um, slow the nitrogen cycle down in some, some instances. So certainly looking at legumes that might actually slow the nitrogen cycle down, um, but legumes that contain tannins that also have an effect in binding uh, ammonia, surplus ammonia in ruminants animals and sending it out in a more organically bound form in the dung as a more recalcitrant form of nitrogen. Um, some research has shown that legume bound tannin um, leg, uh, um, rumen ammonia that's bound by tannins that's sent out in the dung can take up to 25 years to actually release the nitrogen. Um, so you really slow the nitrogen cycle down. And that's one of the strategies around animal urine is, is feeding more legumes with tannin um, and uh, a way of balancing the forage diets. But there's also soil strategies of saturation, compaction, irrigation, management, and soil disturbance, or eliminating soil disturbance. I'll just deal with a few of these to finish off. Um, we know there's a number of commercial products on the market around urease inhibitors that prevent the loss of ammonia, ammonia being an indirect greenhouse gas. Those products do work. The nitrification inhibitors, there's a listing of some of them there. And again, these are products that keep all the nitro nitrogen in the soil in the ammonium form rather than going to nitrate, which can become nitrous oxide or leach nitrate. Then there's a bunch of other products around controlled release or coated fertilizers or slow release nitrogen that might be, excuse me, polymer, polymer embedded or oil-based coatings or just reduced solubility um, uh, compounds like biochar and urea, for example, which has sort of more of a cation exchange or a physical binding of those. Those all work, but the problem they all have is they cost more than conventional fertilizer and you don't get a dramatic yield response 
to using these products. What we have found is the way to use these products is not to put them on at the same rate because you're oversupplying nitrogen anyway, it, but is to cut the rate that you apply back by say 20% and then assume you're getting the same production because you are compensating for the amount of saved nitrogen. That's the way they become cost effective is you're putting on 20% less but getting the same response to that extra nitrogen. Um, now, where I wanted to finish on nitrous oxide is similar to the early life programming concept in methane in, in animals. There is evidence that, for example, the Bracaria grass species has a natural nitrification inhibitor that is exuded out of their roots into the root bio, bio, bio zone, um, and it's called Bracariolone. Um, and it's found in a number of other grasses. Bracaria just so happens to have the largest uh, root exudate. And this is a natural nitrification inhibitor that blocks the formation of nitrate in the soil. Um, and you can see some of the research that was done in Japan on that. I mention this because in both methane case and the nitrous oxide case, we do want to try and shift to something where you're not putting chemicals into the rumen or putting chemicals into the soil to el eliminate these processes, but you're working with nature to try and come up with natural solutions. Just a final thought on, on carbon accounting before I wrap up. Um, and that is that um, in order to do carbon accounting, there are certain rules emerging on what a carbon neutral audit must look like or carbon account must look like. And you have to determine a boundary for that. So it must not be inconsistent with the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory, which means it must count for all the greenhouse gases, subtract off just the annual change in carbon stocks in tree, trees and soil. You can't count all the carbon, you can only count the degree by which it changes in any 12 month period, because we are using a pre-farm to farm gate life cycle calculation. So the greenhouse gas inventory has its own silos. We've drawn out of those silos to say what is relevant to the farm leading up to the farm and to the gate of the farm on an annual basis what is the emissions of greenhouse gases minus the storage or the net change in carbon. So it deals with scope one, which are your direct emissions of methane and nitrous oxide. Scope two, which is electricity emissions that might happen at the power station, but because you consumed it and chose not to do renewable energy, those are yours. And then scope three, which are your indirect emissions as a result of pre-farm purchases or maybe post-farm or between-farm transport. We also then use certain tools and there's a plethora of tools available. I've just listed the ones that I personally host, um, but there are plenty of other tools available. Um, these are the greenhouse emission framework spreadsheet calculators that we host at our website down the bottom. They do break up the emissions into the scope one, scope two, scope three, and allow you to deduct off trees. And we're about to include soils as well in those to give you the full carbon account. Soils is obviously a lot more complicated you can't just put in numbers in 15 minutes and get a soil annual flux. So what do we do about the carbon fluxes? Well, the, the definitive answer is you either go and do a direct measurement of soil carbon or direct measurement of trees, or you can run, say, the full CAM model, which is the Australian government's carbon accounting tier three methodology to get those, that part of the equation. What we've done in our calculators, if you look down at that yellow section at the bottom, is we've run full cam multiple times across multiple uh, agricultural zones and come up with lookup tables that give you a general idea of what full cam may say. So to finish off, research challenges or challenges for future development. I think a lot of our case studies have said an average offset method under the ERF on an individual family farm generates less than 1% of turnover. Now, that's good news for a large corporate that might be you know, able to turn that into millions of dollars, but the average dairy farm in Victoria, that's $2,000. That's not enough to get them moving. Beverly referred to stacking of methods. So can we use stacking of methods to get more comprehensive coverage and turn that into a 10% value proposition? Can we look at more intelligent ways of aggregating emissions on behalf of farmers rather than expecting all 140,000 farmers to engage? What I mean by that is could we have an offset method for the fertilizer companies where they coat all their products with inhibitors and use the offset income to offset the price difference. Or the same for a feed supplier. And finally, you can see that our researchers moved for 
uh, from the 20% options up to the 80% options. We have the potential to reduce methane by 80%, nitrous oxide by over 90%. Um, those options are limited the more extensive you go or to lower middle income countries. And so those two examples I left you with, with early life programming and natural root exudates, give us some hope that there may be more natural, inheritable, intergenerational solutions that we should focus on for the longer term future. Um, thanks, Snow and, and Joe, and I'll hand back to you. Thanks very much, uh, um, <coughs> Beverly and um, Richard. Now we've gone a little bit over time, and that's okay. We're going to keep the session open for another 15 minutes uh, to take questions if people can stay online. Um, so it, it is interesting though to reflect as both of you were talking that the National Party carved out agriculture out of our um, you know, emissions reduction, which I think both of you have given very good evidence for you know, the benefits of including agriculture and its contribution. So Bev, if I could start you with the first question, it's from Mandy, I think. Um, what proportion of the sink that you identified through reducing land clearing and re-vegging is attributable to the actions of agricultural managers either around soil carbon, um, the plantations on farms, or managing fertilizer use? Can we actually attribute uh, that? Thanks, Joe, and thanks uh, for the question. Um, it's it's actually quite a quite a very good question and quite a complex answer in one way, in that um, the sinks that are calculated are done according to very strict accounting rules that are set out under ERF methodologies that are legislated um, under law. So they're there and um, only, only those activities and those account, those um, sources that are, or sinks that are um, legislated and follow the rules can be um, counted. And within the, um, the regrowth methods, for instance, it is only the carbon in the trees that is counted. Yeah. Um, Richard mentioned that um, you know the possible advantage of stacking methods, and the new method that's been um, mooted to be developed next year will allow counting of not only the carbon that's stored in the wood in the trees, but also carbon that may be um, stored in. Uh, in soils or in um, other other vegetation, so that you can bring methods or activities together to do a combined sink. But the um, those values that are given now and that are presented on the um, Clean Energy Regulator websites will be just the carbon that's stored in the in the vegetation itself and woody vegetation. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, Bev. Uh, look, Richard, I have a question that really follows on from that is um, talking about stacking methods, talking about whether it's a, a single farm or an aggregation of farms who brings together, you know, let's say a rumen emissions uh, reduction methodology, perhaps some woody vegetation as well, and uh, registers those projects and wants and achieves carbon neutrality and wants to market its produce on a carbon neutrality label, uh, but it has effectively sold those credits to the government, uh, you know, as an ACU. Uh, would that be double counting? Or, because they wouldn't be expending them elsewhere but they would be just claiming the production methodology is carbon neutral. Uh, look, thanks, no, I, I, I think that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> Never. <laughs> the, the concept of, uh, say, say let's talk about soil carbon credit. If you sold a soil carbon, you generated it on your property and you sold that carbon credit to a third party, be it an ACCU or voluntary market, probably doesn't matter. The moment you sold it, it's no longer yours, it's no longer on your property. That third party is going to use it to remit against their liability. So be it a international obligation where you've sold it outside of Australia as a voluntary carbon market, or you've sold an ACCU on the secondary market to a power station. They're going to retire that against their obligation. You can't claim it anymore. It's not part of your farm. You can't claim the credit. 
Now, I, I, I'll throw to Beverly as well, if you don't mind, because Beverly and I have had this discussion and we're not quite sure. Um, my view is that if you generate a soil carbon credit as an ACCU and you are issued that soil carbon ACCU by the clean energy regulator and you sell it back to government under the reverse auction process, government has used taxpayer money and they retire the credit. They don't retire it against the power station. They don't retire, retire it against any industry in particular. They just retire the credit out of circulation. I personally don't see a problem why the government can't claim that, why the industry that generated can't claim it, and why the individual farm can't still claim that carbon credit, because there's no risk of double counting. Now, I've asked a number of people in government to clarify that, if that is possible, and I'm not getting any answers yet, but my logic says it should be. Ev, perhaps uh, you can have a, a short answer to this and uh, yeah. We can put it in the too hard basket, but it's obviously a crucial question for farmers wishing to, um, you know, participate in these schemes. Yeah, it is a crucial question, and um, I guess there's two way. There's there's two points. If you undertake uh, carbon labelling to become a a carbon neutral product under the government's climate active scheme. Um, they will not count credits, as far as I understand, they'll not count credits that have been sold to government. So to get that label, that formal accreditation under the Climate Active System of Carbon Neutrality, you can't have already sold it. So you can have your income or you can retain it and then perhaps get a premium price for your product as carbon neutral. There is, I think it's different to make a, a claim on the basis of um, an industry-wide or a, a farm-wide account. And um, finally, just before I go, I'll just say this is one of the subjects that is going to be discussed, I think, at the current COP because countries are in the same boat with um, emissions being undertaken in their country and being sold to another country. And that double counting question is, uh, is why they, they haven't so far finalised those rules around international trading of carbon credits. Thanks, Bev. So it does, does raise a very tricky issue for us about carbon neutral claims, because there are a number of farms that are claiming carbon neutrality and accessing premium markets. Um, because we did an audit on their property. They haven't engaged in the ERF. They haven't generated ACCUs. They've not bothered with all the paperwork. They have just got us to do an audit on their property and demonstrate that they have enough sequestration to offset their emissions. And the market seems to have accepted that claim because it's a peer-reviewed paper. So we've, we've got this emerging situation where you can go with the climate active definition, but you have to, you can't count surrendered or, or traded ACCUs. Also, if you've got your own sequestration, you have to have engaged in the ERF and to retire the credits against your carbon neutrality. So you can't actually not engage and claim climate active definition carbon neutrality. Uh, you've got to have engaged in the system and a lot of farmers don't want to. Um, and so we are seeing third party accreditations emerging as a result. Thank you. Um, Richard, back to you. <laughs> Peter Labor has a question about Really, I guess competing technologies. So in livestock, you've got various methods to reduce methane and you'll also be able to manage nitrous oxide. Are these likely to be additive or are we likely to see the most cost effective of these different approaches will you know, be widespread? Yeah, Peter, it, it's, it's, it's a case by case there because there are examples both ways. Um, so for example, uh, take the Lucina example. Obviously, what you've done is you've added a legume into a system that's nitrogen deficient. So actually, when we did the full audit, we said, well, there's a degree by which methane's come down as a result of the legume, but we've got more nitrogen going into the animals, so there should be more nitrous oxide. Fortunately, it turns out more nitrous oxide was very, very insignificant in that system because it was quite deficient in the first place. So you've got that more soil carbon, more less methane, but more nitrous oxide all happening in that one system. Those need to be reconciled internally. Um, you, you've also got other, other options. For example, one of the things that isn't spoken about much in building soil organic matter or soil carbon is that if you build soil organic matter, say in a dairy soil in South Gippsland, 
and you have an extreme climate event, you've got double the amount of nitrogen sitting in that soil that can go out as nitrous oxide. The biggest nitrous oxide event we've ever measured in our research came out of a long-term grazing field that we put a plow through. Um, that was 10 kilos of nitrous oxide that came out within a couple of days. Um, so we, we have to balance these. And this is where I would like to see our offsets method go eventually is a whole farm mechanistic modeling approach that reconciles all the competing pools and you get a whole farm package deal out of it rather than just stacking empirical methods that are not inconsistent with each other. Bev, this is a question actually from John Dixon. Um, and it, uh, John's asked him, what is the effect of latitude or soil, tem um, soil temperature on soil carbon sequestration? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Again, it's a complex answer. Um, so that, that particular meta-analysis actually found some interesting results um, with respect to latitude. So in Victoria, in the southern states, um, there was a decline in soil carbon with increasing um, elevation, uh, whereas in the Queensland, it went the other way. So um, the conclusion that the authors reached was that it was most likely related to climate factors, but perhaps also to soil changes. And um, if you look at their results overall, the two most important factors in terms of um, statistically significant drivers were aridity and clay content. And that's not surprising to any soil scientists, I'm sure. But um, some of the others did vary did, and interact, obviously. The, um, the second part of the question on temperature is that one, uh, apart from effects of temperature on growth that can occur in some limiting um, areas, one of the main impacts of temperature is on the rate of turnover of, so of soil organic matter in the soil. So the activity of the um, microbes in the soil and because soil carbon stored is a balance between what comes in as organic matter in forms of litter and root um, and exudates um, and what is lost. And that lost component is extremely important because that's what breaks down the organic matter to provide the nutrients for further plant growth. So temperature actually has an interacting effect in that way. Thank you. Uh, we're almost running out of time, but I'll just have a question for Richard here from Larissa Taylor. Richard, can you look through, look, think about the Australian ag supply chains? Do you think are most likely to be able to measure emissions accurately and then halve emissions by 2030? And I think, Bev, you may also have a, a view about this. So where do you think we'll be able to make the most gains realistically? Yeah, thanks, Larissa. Um, the, in terms of measure, I'd, I'd probably say it wouldn't actually be direct measure, obviously, because that's really expensive. Um, but there, there are enough tools available now to look at all sectors of agriculture at a farm to regional basis to, to quantify those greenhouse gas emissions. There's a long, long way to go in these tools because the tools use the national inventory method and are required to be consistent with the national inventory method. But in many cases, they just multiply total nitrogen fertilizer by 0.4 and give you an answer. So it isn't soil type or rainfall specific and and we do need to move in that direction. Having said that, tools like APSOM, Dairy Mod, the Southern Grazing Systems models are capable of doing all those pools and giving you those answers that are not inconsistent with the inventory. So I think we can, I think we can get there. In terms of halving emissions, I think that'll be an industry by industry basis. Very easy for a viticultural operation to be carbon neutral because their emissions are very small. Um, if you pigs and poultry, it's really the effluent management system you've got to take care of. If you brought acre wheat, it's a lot more challenging because you're talking about less than half a percent of the total nitrogen fertilizer across that entire property being nitrous oxide. That's where I think the smarter way to do it is instead of dealing with 40,000 grains producers, you deal with one fertilizer company to coat all the fertilizer that's sold so that you knock 40% out of all the nitrous oxide from the fertilizer sold in Australia and you're only dealing with four entities that can subsidize the price to the farmer. That to me makes far more sense about how to achieve that on the broad acre agriculture areas. 
Thank you. Um, Bev, a final comment? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the question of can we measure it, I think is really important because the national inventory is probably um, one of the better, better accounting tools on a nationwide um, basis, but the actions that are being taken on an individual farm are not going to be served well for calculating carbon credits by some of the, the national modelling. It just can't be accurate on every spot. And soil carbon in particular is highly variable over space and, and time. And, um, you know, if we could measure it all um, often, we would uh, probably need a, a huge bucket load of funding, but, um, but and that's not going to happen. So we have to balance costs and accuracy to the extent that suits the purpose. And in terms of halving emissions, I guess um, the only caution I would have is that offsets are really critical, but we have to understand that there is um, a limit on the land extent that can be um, planted to woody <coughs> vegetation or the extent to which we can continue to store carbon in soils. <coughs> there are natural equilibriums related to both the natural constraints on area and we have to be conscious of the need to manage land for food production and manage within that constraint. But we, you know, there are win-wins for that and also for ecosystem services that hang off some of those um, uh, activities that are done to increase sequestration in the land sector. And getting that balance right is not easy, but I think it's worth looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank both our speakers today, Richard and Bev, for a really very stimulating talk. I think I'm finally beginning to get my head around some of the complexities. It's, it's really amazing. And I think it's unfortunate that we see in the public um, sphere, we don't actually see a lot of cogent argument clearly presented. And I think both of you have done an excellent job today. So I'd like to thank all the, the people who joined the webinar for joining, and I, I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.